Uh, I'm Norman Kilmer, owner and operator of uh, Morgan County Seeds. Some of this equipment I'll be talking about today is actually backed by the arena on a trailer. So if you want to go look at it, you can. Uh, since we don't have the overheads here, uh, I'm just going to go through my slides here and let you follow on the sheet there. I know it's not colored, but it'll give you an idea what it is anyway. Get my thing situated here to where I can start flipping these around. My speech is mainly targeted to vegetable equipment, and towards the last we'll get into high tunnels. So uh, I just put this together within the last couple of weeks here over a matter of evenings. So on the first slide there you notice a BCS tiller. I know most of us are small growers here. We don't get into the large equipment like tillers where they go behind the tractors that till maybe 10 or 12 foot width. Uh, I know I don't out there on my farm. We have a 75 acre farm there and at one time we grew six acres of vegetables. And we used the BCS tiller to till a lot of that after we repaired it with the bigger equipment and laid the plastic mulch. But there was green beans and that type of stuff that you just couldn't till properly without having a smaller tiller. So our tiller got into Mary's use and we've owned the BCS tiller like this since 1980. Um, one, I think it was somewhere in that, not 81, when I'm saying my daughter isn't that old. My old, my youngest daughter, when she was, before she was born, we got it, and she's 25 now, so 24, 25, somewhere in that area. I can't even keep track of it. But we've had it all these years. There was at one time we was putting over 100 hours on this tiller a year. That's two sets of tines, by the way. Uh, any t rear tine tiller will be handy. They don't have to be the BCS variety. We just picked on that because my brother sells them and I had access to the pitchers quite easily. Uh, we used to prepare the soil when we was getting ready to plant like green beans or even anything that was put in row crops that was planting with a little earthway garden seed or whatever. And when we grown six acres of vegetables, our children were smaller. We had we have four children, so there's six of us total. We would put out on an every two week basis, approximately, and we're from 500 to 1,000 feet of green beans uh, uh, in that time period. Uh, the variety we picked, we could pick about three or four pickings off of it until they started looking shabby. And then we'd till them under and turn around and plant some more. And that's where this tiller comes in handy, or any root time tiller would work great for this. You can go on a small plot like that, till it up for the next crop. So that makes it quite handy that way. Uh, you also noticed on that sheet there that I have a uh, high wheel cultivator. Now for you folks that like to go to the gym and get exercise, uh, let's save our money and do your own exercise in your garden uh, or your produce patch. Not only will you save in gym fees, but I think you end up getting a better workout than you would there, plus you're helping your crop along. So that's one thing we can do there. Uh, we never used one of them because uh, well, it's a whole lot handier. Just grab the tiller and go do the tilling. So, and I don't know if it's the first page or the second page. I have a, a precision earthway garden seed that I was talking about. This is a very handy tool. Now, one of the questions we get asked all the time is, does it work? And I'll answer the question this way. If you're the type of person out there that puts a stake in each end of your plot and, and stretches a string or a rope and takes a hoe out there and you pull your fur or the plant your seeds in there and you're just as happy as a lark, you're going to love the earthway garden seeder because it's going to open up the row, plant the seed, and mark the next row off and cover the first row for you all in one shot. However, if you're out there with your rope making your rows here and you're cussing at the dirt clots or talking to them or whatever the case may be, you're going to do the same thing with a garden seeder, guaranteed. So that falls back to have a nice, fine, worked up soil. And that's where a root tine tiller really comes in handy in small areas like that. Now, if you guys that are in bigger areas, well, there's, they always make them to go behind tractors. So that's something very handy there. Uh, one of the other pages, since I don't have a pages here in front of me, we show a, a, a mulch layer. And this layer, by the way, is the blue one back on the trailer there. Uh, my oldest son builds this one. 
And I'm going to show you several different ones in here. I'm not going to pick on one particular manufacturer. And we're going to go through the different ones here. But before we go there, what's the idea of a plastic mulch layer? Why use a plastic mulch layer? Uh, number one thing, if you're growing vegetables, you always have problem with weeds. I know I do. Maybe you guys are different. Another thing is moisture. You want to conserve moisture. So if we can tilt in there with a machine that they call the plastic uh, mulch laying machine, make a ridge. Now they also make flat layers, but I recommend the ridge layer. This particular one here makes a five inch bed. Some of the others will make bigger or snare beds. It depends on the manufacturer, who made it, and everything else. There's some adjustables, but this particular one makes a five inch bed. If you use three, a four foot wide poly, you look at a 30 inch top. If you use the three foot, it's 20 inch. And most of the other manufacturers follow these same guidelines. It will lay a, plastic, a drip line down for you. You can adjust them to where they lay above the soil or below the soil. Now, if you're growing any crop besides sweet potatoes, I recommend burying the drip line. Do not do that with sweet potatoes because they will grow around that drip line. And they're a little bear cat to dig anyway, but if you gotta fight the drip line yet, it's so much harder. Over top of this whole deal, it lays a sheet of plastic. Anywhere from one mil to a mil and a quarter, depends which one you use, and it covers the edges all in one shot. So now you got either a 20 or 30, 20 or 30 inch wide bed there that's covered with a place of plastic, you have a drip line underneath for your moisture that you can also run your fertilizer through. So you're all ready to go. You're going to give them old weeds a hard time. You're going to conserve your moisture. And then you can either go back through there and plant them by hand or with a, a transplanter, which we'll get into later. Uh, the very next one shows a, a small rain flow model there. This is their mini version. Uh, they actually went, and the one with the tank in front of it might be the next sheet there. It's a, or wherever it's at on there. Uh, Rainflow, by the way, is a company that's noted their equipment is considered the Cadillac of the produce equipment. Uh, they're a little more pricey than the rest of them. They get some features the others don't have, and I won't get into all that to make a sales feel out of it. But that's, that's a smaller unit. Both of these units we have shown so far is for smaller tractors. And for most of you smaller growers, this is what you'd be looking at. A little later on in the same, I think it's in the same sheet or anything, you'll notice a 2550 rain flow. And uh, this is a bigger unit. It'll, yeah, I can do that. Let me get this, uh, if you can see them from back there. Now these are color and yours are black and white, so yeah. You found it there? Okay. This unit here is adjustable. Now, Rainflow makes two models. I just got a copy of the 2550 and they got a 2600. Those are the model numbers to them. The 2550 makes from a, uh, I think they go all the way from about a three inch to a five inch bed, or is it seven inch? I'd have to look again. The 2600 will go up to nine inches in height. The 2550 is either three or four foot width plastic and your 2600 will also take a five foot plastic. Now one thing with the Rainflow equipment is they have what they call an auto row track on it. And all that means if you have it hooked up to your tractor and you're going out through the field, and I don't know of anybody that can make a perfect straight line with a tractor. You think you can, but there's used a little crook in there. Or I do anyway, maybe your guys a difference. But uh, this machine automatically will correct itself to keep that row in straight. So. That's one of the features that Rainflow has that adds to the cost. Uh, actually, one of the other photos here shows it used being used. It might not be too clear on your copies there, but if you guys want to look at these color photographs afterwards, you're welcome to it. So that's no problem there. So, but, uh, and we'll continue to the next picture which shows actually Rainflow's flat layer. Uh, it's just a flat layer that's laid out on the, sitting on the, on the concrete. The very next photo actually shows it being used. 
What's the difference in between a flat layer and a ridge layer? Let me hold both of these up here. So since I don't have the page numbers on here, I don't know where they're at in yours, so we're just going to wait. The second page, okay. This shows how the machine looks before it's used and after it's being used. The difference in between a flat layer and a ridge layer is the ridge layer will make a ridge. Now the manufacturer companies do anywhere from I think the narrowest, shortest one I've seen was three inches all the way up to the California growers, they'll go up to 12 inches. So that's quite a deal. They use that a lot of strawberries. On your flat layer, it does not make a ridge. It's perfectly flat. Your two deals on the side actually go down and make like a little trench. It stretches your drip line and your poly over that and then it fills the trench back in. So your plastic is right even with the top of the soil. Which one works the best? I personally want a ridge over the flat layer. <clears throat> the reason for that is if you get in a wet situation, your ridge as a rule stays drier. In a cool season area where you're cool in the spring, the ridge warms up quicker than your flat layer does because it's, it, mess, it heats it up, it's a little off the ground there and every, it just seems to heat up a little quicker. So that's been our personal experience. Uh, oh, I forgot some of these others in here. You got one showing there with a team of horse pulling a flat layer there. And actually that gentleman there is the owner of Nolt's Produce Supply. His name is Warren Nolt. His wife's my first cousin, to be honest with you. And these, these next few photos were taken actually in Michigan at the Horse Progress Days, which just coming year in July would be held in Arthur, Illinois area. So i like to see if I can attend. I've never been at them. They say there's a lot of fun. Uh, that actually, the first one we showed there with the horses there with Warren walking behind it. <coughs> Excuse me there. Just don't get an idea to run because I'm liable to bark at you like an old beagle dog and take after you. Uh, that one there with the first one that we showed there, that one there that's actually designed to be pulled behind a tractor or you can take the drawbar off and use it as a three-point model. The other one that he shows where Warren's actually sitting on the deal, this one here, uh, that is a horse-drawn one. What he's doing while he's on there, he's adjusting the two steel wheels on either side so they can make a straight row. So in other words, he's basically the auto steer on that thing. <coughs> on the next sheet, we have a, a layer that's made actually in Ohio by an Amishman. This one's got a fertilizer attachment to it. So this gives you a little idea of the different types of layers that are out there. Get rid of this cough up, be you feel a little better, but that's the way it goes. Okay, the next slide we show, we have got what we call water wheel transplanters. These come in several different companies, and I have just two different ones I show here. I think it's just two different ones, or might be three. The first ones we show is the Rainflow brand, and it shows a, a pull tight one and a, a three point model. Now, the pull tight one can be made in the three point. And there's not a whole lot of difference in between the two. The Rainflow brand has a divided tank on it. So the guy sitting on the tractor that's pulling this can watch whoever's sitting back there in the two seats doing the planting. What a water wheel transplanter does, there's a wheel that attaches to with a set of spikes that punches a hole into the poly, fills the hole with water, and then it removes the spike. The people sitting in the seat as that hole bypasses and reaches over and puts a plant into that hole. That's all you need to do because when you put your plant in there you displace the water which in turn throws a little soil over top of it so you have good contact there. Uh, one year we put out 5,000 cantaloupe plants with one of these machines. It was of course a homemade one but it worked great. That's before we were selling so much equipment. Uh, I think out of the 5,000, we might have lost maybe 100 plants total. So, you know, I th we thought it was pretty good. And this is a machine that gets used quite a bit on smaller produce farms and the bigger ones. Actually, the very next slide there shows the water wheel transplanter being used behind the tractor. 
Uh, later on, we'll have a photo, of, a little better photo of the wheels here. I didn't have one of these in stock, right? I brought a transplanter along for you to look at, so, but. Uh, and then the following slide, here again, this is a Michigan pitcher from Farm Progress Days. This is a transplanter that's built by an Amishman from Ohio. It's on steel wheels. I don't know if he has rubber wheels available or not, but for the Amish, that works perfect. And there you can actually see him sitting on there planting the plants. On that one there. Just show you a few more here. The following slide here is showing Warren Nolt standing alongside of one of his planters there with the two girls doing the plant. And the photo right below it, I don't know how good you can see it, you, know, you might want to come up here later on to look at this slide here. There's a wheel called the super wheel, and that's what we're trying to show down there. You have the ability for each one of these transplant wheels to have six different plant spacings. How is that possible? The spikes that are in that wheel, you can take out and replace wherever you want them for different spacings. You can have different sizes of spikes come in there. They start from an A spike and go all the way to, I think the last one's an F, which is very small. The A's are quite large. And the reason for these different sizes of spikes is for your, your uh, pot that you grew your plant in to, to, to grow it. You might use a four and a half inch or a four inch pot or maybe the three and a half. So you'd be looking at like a number A spike because that makes a big hole. If you're growing into like a 105 cell or something that's a lot smaller, you may be using an E or D spike, or maybe even the F spike. So it has a lot to do with your, your size of your plants, your transplants. Uh, for onion plants, they use the E spike, just to give you an idea. Uh, we actually have a special wheel that's built that we get made by Rainflow that's got two rows of spikes on each wheel. They're six, they're six inches apart diagonally. In other words, you have a hole here, and you have another one over here, so there's six inches back and forth. In between each row is 12 inches. So you can get a lot more onions on a roll of plastic like this than you can a single row. Uh, we have people that show up there, they want to buy two of these wheels, put them on a transplanter at one time. It's fine and dandy if you got a tractor with a super, super, super creeper. Because 12 inches apart for two rows doesn't sound that far apart. But most tractors travel a little too fast for a person to keep up with trying to put the plants in there by themselves. You put two of these wheels on, you better have somebody that can plant awful fast or like I said, a tractor was a super low creeper because it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of coronation to get them in there. What most folks do in that situation where they're using double wheel, they'll offset a little bit and go one side down the plastic get the end of the row, they turn around and come back over the same sheet. So the first time you come down, you're laying your plant and your plants on over here, and the next time you're on this side. So you end up with four rows on a sheet on a plastic. You can get up to six rows on there, you just gotta readjust your wheels on there. So that's in onions. Most of your other crops, like tomatoes and peppers and that type of stuff, are single rows. There is people that go double row on peppers. Uh, most of them go single row. So, now, we've seen how to till the soil up, how we get the tr plastic down in a drip line, the machine that we can use to plant it. What happens after that? We're gonna have weeds to control and other things called insects and diseases. There is a way of controlling these too, whether you're chemical or organic. Uh, the following sheet shows a sprayer. Now this one didn't come out very good. This is actually a crop crayer sprayer. It's a single boom sprayer. It's high pressure. There's other manufacturers that build these too. I'm just picking on crop care because that's one of the companies that we represent. We also carry the Penn Creek brand of it. There's, they have a 25 foot boom on that's adjustable. They can have roll low to your crop or it will elevate high enough to where you get over top of your sweet corn. And with 280 to 300 pounds of pressure on there, 
when that spray comes out of that nozzle, it'll actually swirl down around the gra ground and swirl up underneath your leaves. It's just amazing how it works. Uh, one of the farm tours there on Central Missouri Produce Auction, uh, James Shirk had one that he built himself. On that particular tour day, he set his sprayer up with just water in it, and he demonstrated how that really works. And it's just amazing. That sprayer was about three, the boom was about three foot off the ground. And he fired that tractor up, kicked that pump in gear, and opened the valves up. That spray just come out of them nozzles and down and instantly curled around. It was just like a big whirlwind there. It was just going around and around. And that was all done by that high pressure coming out of that nozzle is what does it. And that's what you want in a produce situation. Because the insects and diseases are hiding not only the top of the leaves, but underneath. So you need to have a very good coverage. Now, can anybody afford one of these sprayers? Well, most likely not. Uh, the uh, 300 gallon one's gonna run you anywhere from about 2,000. If you get a manual fold boom, that's like the Penn's Creek, it's around $3,000. This one here that's actually showed up has got a hydraulic boom on it. That one there I think is around six, $8,000. So it's a little higher priced sprayer. Uh, so it just depends what the person wants. Or you can do, like I said, James Shirk does, you can build your own. Uh, they use a uh, John Sump's a pump company, and it's a big diaphragm pump. So you could build your own if you had to. And they're also available on three point. So there's various manufacturers out there that build them. Another thing that will come in handy, since if you're using the plastic moss coach culture, the other slide shows actually a shielded sprayer that you can go over top of your plastic with the shields down along inside. This is if you want to put herbicides down, whether it's a glyphosate or whatever it might be. I wouldn't recommend the 2,4-D product. Or whether you're a certified organic grower and you're using your vinegar or your certified organic herbicides. But you want to protect your plants. So this particular sprayer has actually got a shield that runs alongside the plastic to keep that spray from getting over onto your crop. Now the guys down there around Central Missouri Produce Auction, where I'm from, after they have their plastic laid, they'll actually go in there and sow wheat at the rate of about four bushels to an acre. In between, they just broadcast it out there. Let it grow. Let it get up to about a foot in height. And usually by this time, they'll have a crop planted in there, but not always. And they'll come in there with a shielded sprayer of some type and kill that wheat in between there. That will create a nice mat in between the row there so it don't get muddy. And as a rule, that will last the biggest part of the summer. Towards the fall, you might have some weeds coming up through. But this is what they're doing. By using wheat, you can burn it down with a vinegar. You can burn it down with a, like a post. It's a grass, so it's fairly easy to knock down. Some of the guys in the area, they use the glyphosate, which I'm not too fond lover of anymore. Glyphosate by the name is... Trade name everybody knows it by is Roundup. So, now suppose we are a smaller grower, we only have a small plot, and uh, we don't have the funds to put everything out we want to, but yet we like to control. The next one shows an Amishman pushing a sprayer that's a 12 volt battery operated. This is another picture from Horse Progress Days. Uh, I think this one's made in Ohio. But looking that thing over, basically what they've done is just took a pot, sprout sprayer that you can pick up anywhere, made a little chassis put under it, put a 12 volt battery on there, and build a boom. And looks like a double wheel wheelbarrow underneath of it. So that's something somebody can easy build if you can't find a source for them. Uh, there, I'm not sure on the pressure on this one here. Most of them little uh, sure flow pump pressures. Do good if they put 75, 80 pounds of pressure out. It depends a lot on your on your nozzle spacing, how many nozzles you have, and which particular pump you have. I know looking through the crop care catalog yesterday, I was looking through there, I seen some of them they had 1.3 and 1.6 gallons a minute. So and I don't I think they was writing at 80 pounds of pressure if I remember right. So that makes a difference. How many nozzles you have and what size nozzles is, how much water it's gonna take, or your liquid is going to determine what your pressure is and what your output is. So there's a lot of variables that come in place there. So 
That's just something that we got to look into. The falling deal here is a unique little deal here. It's also a crop care product. There's other companies that build these. Uh, it's called a picking at cyst. And there's two photographs. I think they're on top of one another there. This machine is very handy if you're transplanting, picking strawberries, green beans, or any low growing crop like this. And uh, you want to take a nap while you're growing it and wait every once in between. Because you're laying on your belly, you got your hands hanging down in front of you as you pick your crop, and right directly in front of your hands is a tray where you put your what are you repicking into? One of my employees there said the only thing missing with this machine that he sees is there ought to be a bladder tank put up in the top somewhere and I have a tube down somewhere with the nipple water on like the hogs do. So when you pick in there and get a little bored, you might want to put some beer or whiskey up in there. So after a while, you get your mind dead. You just don't care what you do anymore. <laughs> that was one of my employees come up with that idea. But I think water would be a better idea in there. So, but... Actually, the young gentleman that's on there demonstrating, I got to meet his dad in Michigan. And when these photos were taken in a strawberry patch, the strawberries were just about over. Now, they put out a DVD with this on it that shows them actually how it works. And we had two of these in, in, the, in stock last year. We don't have any right now. And they're pretty neat little machines there, actually. Uh, they're foot-powered. I mean, electrical-powered. Uh, well, the guy laying down there on his, uh, let me see, it'd be his left foot there, is a button right behind his foot there that he can hit with his toe or his foot and make the machine go forward or backwards depending on which way he has his switch. Uh, you might not be able to see it, but the handle that actually pulls the machine, you turn around backwards, and that's your steering wheel for this thing. So when you're down there picking, your foot makes the machine go a little further, and when he gets out of steer, you just reach over here and guide the thing as you're picking. So I think Lincoln University in uh, Jeff City has actually one that was built overseas that has a Caterpillar tracks on. I have not seen it yet. I've heard Sanjin talk about it already. Uh, those are pretty expensive. And taking the Missouri mud, you might have to have a Caterpillar tracks. Uh, this rubber tire one, it's amazing what it does go through. Now, we've got our crop laid, we got to plant it, and we got to harvest it, and that's the end of the year. We're going to have to get rid of this plastic. So the next photograph shows two mulch lifters. Uh, there's actually one of these back on the trailer there, like the one on the top. Uh, there's several different mulch lifters. Let's just flip on to the next one here. That's, if I remember right, that's Crop Care's wrapper lifter. What these machines do, they go alongside of the, the poly, the plastic that you laid. Well, first of all, they split it right down the center with a collar. They have a set of shears that come up underneath, like ply shears that come up underneath the poly. And there's a set of discs in the front that pulls the edge of the soil away that's laying on top of the plastic. Behind these ply shears, there's a set of fingers like a potato digger used to have years ago that actually lifts the poly up and helps shake the rest of the debris off, the dirt or whatever it might be. Now in a situation where you have like tomato plants and crops in there ready, you might want to go in with a sickle bar more, or like I used to do, I used to hang, hook, hook on to the more conditioner and go and mow them off right even with the, with the top of the plastic. And then this will lift it right up out of there and you, you're able to pick it up. With the first ones I showed there, you physically have to go in there and pick it up by hand yourself. Now, I know a gentleman down in Pierce City that actually takes the lifter in there and lifts it like that, and then he takes a rake in there and puts in a windrose and comes in there with a big round baler and, and rolls it up. There's one advice he gave me. If you want to do that, there's one thing you'll remember. Do not make your bales more than three inches diameter. Otherwise, you won't pick them up. They're heavy. The crop care one has got its own wrapper system built onto it. It actually takes a person run of the tractor and a person standing on the platform back there. What the platform guy does there is control the speed of them spools as it rolls the poly up and the drip line all in one deal. 
Also, when that spool comes full, you flip a little lever, the spool collapses it, and you can pull it right off of there, and it'd be a nice, neat little tootsie roll there with a hole through the middle. So, now knowing working around poly, I know this has got a little bit of weight involved in there, because let's face it, a four foot wide, 4,000 foot long roll of poly, that's a mill and a quarter thick, you're looking at right at 100 pounds. So plastic don't weigh much until you get it rolled up, and then it's a different story. There's various companies that make these. Uh, some of the other companies that I know of is like uh, the Mechanical Transplanter, the Holland Company, Kenco. Uh, there's quite a few in Ohio, Amishmen that build different ones. Uh, and they're built all over. And there's people that build these machines by themselves too. Now let's switch gears. You see a picture of a high tunnel, one of the next pictures in there. This particular tunnel is actually one that I helped put up. This one's down in uh, Cape Corrado, Missouri. It's put up on a widow lady's farm. It was a high tunnel workshop that we'd done there for her. Uh, if you guys ever worked around sand, you know what I'm talking about. I'm used to working around clay loam. They had a skid there, skid there loader there for us to use. I learned one thing very quick with sand. You do not turn a skid steer loader around on a dime like you do on the, on the clay. Because if you do, you're going to stay sitting right there. You're stuck. That's one thing I learned very quickly. High tunnel is a very good deal to extend your season, whether it's in the beginning of the part of the season or the end. I was just talking to a gentleman here today that was talking about he's still got tomatoes in his tunnels. Okay, and there's another lady here that does. So this is one way to extend your season whether you want to get it earlier or later. I'm looking out through the crowd, there's several of you in here, I know it's got tunnels, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, tunnels come in various different companies make them. Uh, there's various weights of them. Actually, actually, the following photograph shows a tunnel inside with tomatoes in it. Uh, this was actually taken at Horse Progress Days in Michigan. I just put this one in here to give you an idea what, what it can look like. I mean, like I said, I'll have these photos up here that you look at them color later on. There is two types of steels on the sides, how you control your eventilation. Uh, actually, there's a, it's a page with the four photogra three photographs on them. The top one is a tunnel that we have sold and I helped put up in Russellville, Missouri. The reason I put this one in here is to show you the drop curtains. The one below is actually out of the uh, Farm Tech magazine, so it most likely didn't come very, out very good. But it's got the roll-up sides. What's the difference in between these two ventilation deals? We have a drop curtain that opens in the top and opens towards the bottom. We have a roll-up that starts in the bottom and rolls liberally up to open it up. They both have their, their benefits and they both have their back draws. If you're growing warm season crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and etc., you want the drop curtain. And why? Because this starts opening up at about a five foot height or an eight foot, depends what your sidewall is, and opens down. Your cool air comes in, that opening goes right through the tunnel and out the other side. If your crop's not tall enough to where it hits this particular threshold there where the air's coming through, your crop stays nice and warm and you're ventilating the top of your tunnel. Of the tunnels that we sell, this is by far the most popular one. Now, if you're growing cold season crops, like your brassicas, uh, maybe petunias, or if you're growing things on benches, you want the roll up that opens from the bottom up. Because a cool season crop, you want to cool the crop too because they don't like hot weather. And what I mean by brackets is we're talking about cabbage and broccoli and that type of stuff. Also your lettuces and your spinaches. So then you want to cool them off. Can you grow them type of cool weather crops in a drop curtain? Yes, you just might have to open it up further. Both of these systems can either be set up to where they're manual. The drop curtain, they have a winch in the inside that you crank it one way or another, they either open or close your curtain. 
On the rolled up sides, you liberally have a crank that rolls the curtain up for you with a tube going down from one end of the tunnel to the other, and it liberally rolls the poly up onto that tube. Both of these setups can be automated. It adds a little cost to the, to the structure. For folks that are not around on a regular basis, that want to grow in the tunnel, and want that comfortability of a machine taking care of the tunnel where they're gone, this is the way of going it. Cost-wise, on a drop curtain to make it automatic, you're looking somewhere around $1,500, give or take. On a roll-up, that one's a little less. Uh, that's most likely around 1000 There might be some other cheaper ones out there, just to give you an idea. Now, these prices, I'm just pulling off the top of my head to remember. The roll-up, I'd have to look definitely what it is, but the drop curtain one I'm familiar with. So, Let's see what else I've in. Now, there's various different ventilation ways that they can use also besides just your side curtains. The very next photograph shows a picture of the Lincoln University's high tunnel in Jefferson City. This was actually the day that this photo here is it shows that we're putting the, the covering on it. The reason I put this in here, this is a ridge vent. Uh, what that works in the ridge vent is with your side openings, whether it's a drop curtain or roll up, you can ventilate that hot air out of the top. It can be either rolled up manually. This is a roll up from the bottom of, the, of that ridge vent to the top. And it's usually about a three foot opening. Various manufacturers have different ways to do it. This is just the way the Zimmermans do that I'm affiliated with. I know FarmTech had seen advertise one where they actually had a, a piece in the roof that actually detached. And here last year, I didn't get to see it up at the Great Plains Growers Conference. There's a guy there from Pennsylvania that had come up with a ridge vent system that was a whole lot cheaper. And it looked to me like the poly just rolled back or forward somehow. I didn't get to see it. I just seen a little brief expert on it. So there's various ways you can wind out of the top. How much difference does this make if you can get the, air, the hot air out of the top? It's amazing the difference it makes. Uh, I know one of the years down there in the Central Missouri Produce Auction Farm Tours, we visited the Lead Brothers, which they hit them about every year. But this particular time, they took us in through their gutter connect tunnels. Those are actually greenhouses. The one of them did not have a ridge vent, it just had the side vents. Their bigger unit, which was a Nexus unit, that's in 90 by 144 if I got my figures right, it had the side vent and it had a ridge vent on. And by the way, that's an $80,000 unit they have there. You did not need a thermometer to tell the difference. When you was in the first one that only had the side vending, it was comfortable in there, a little on the hot side. If you walked out of that one and walked in the other one, it felt like you walked into an air-conditioned room. That's the difference your top vending makes. It's just amazing the difference it does make. Uh, it adds cost to the structure, uh, and it's something that most companies, you can put it on later if you don't buy with the original package. So, but it's something that might be worthwhile looking into. And then, of course, the very last photograph that we have on there, this is another tunnel I helped put up. This is actually where I trained our new crew that puts them up. This one is down in Alton, Missouri. There's just a small tunnel. It's got eight foot sidewalls, and this one's totally automatic. The reason I put this photo in, this photo has a shade cloth on the top. That's a 47% woven shade material that's put on top there. It's amazing the difference a shade cloth can make in a tunnel. Uh, there's various colors you can get into it. Uh, there's white, there's black, there's silver. They all have their uses. The cheapest one is the rolls of black one, so that's the one we sell the most of, and I think that's the most popular color there is. Uh, I had seen Robin Hale just step in here, and I think she disappeared on me. Down in Osceola, Missouri, they have they had a little experiment with one of their tunnels and tomatoes. Part of it, they cover it with a black shade cloth, and the other with the white. It was very interesting what showed up out of there. The end that had the black covering on the tomatoes produced a little heavier on that end than it did in the end with the white covering on. I don't know why this is, but that's just the way it seemed to work at that time. 
Now, maybe the other somebody else had done the same thing. They might have had it totally opposite. So experiments like that has to be represented over several times, period, before you actually get a true picture. And then you got to take a lot of variance in. What was your air temperature, your wind speed, and uh, uh, what type of year do you have? So it's, there's a lot of little variants that go in there. That's basically the end of the deal there. Uh, like I said, some of this equipment's back at the trailer. Feel free to go look at it. If you want to look at these full color photographs, you don't have a time here, I'll have them at the Morgan County Seed booth. Feel free to look through them. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, one thing, you're, you're looking at 300 pounds of pressure. Them nozzles are only putting out like a, anywhere from 5 to 15 gallons an acre. So there's not that much water come out. It comes out as a mist, like a fog. Okay. It's that under pressure there, when it comes out there, it creates a fog with the air behind it that creates your whirl. So... I, do, I think you can actually put your hand underneath one of these nozzles and you most likely wouldn't. You could feel it was there, but it wouldn't hurt you. Is, is there, is anybody making some ones? We're having real good luck on the tomatoes putting a double drip line on each side. Uh huh. Especially out in the field. Uh, anybody making a mulch layer that will do a double drip line? As far as I know, those are available to, through all companies. They are. Yeah, it's, you just got to order them in. You just, when you order your, ton, your, your, kit, your uh, layer in, you just got to tell them you want a double drip line on it, and there'll be two tubes on it, and your reel that holds your your uh, drip line on will be double. Most of the time, they have a single pole with a with a roll on either side of the pole is what they do. So it's something that's done. Yes, sir. How far is Zimmerman behind on high tunnel orders that are farm tech closer? Uh, I'm not sure how far our farm tech's behind, but I do the Zimmermans right now. Us ourselves are right about four weeks behind filling orders. Uh, they had a little mess up over there that's cost them, and Neil Zimmerman was not happy about it the way the steel company used him, but he was at their mercy. So they're playing catch up right now with us. As far as how far farm tech's behind, I have no idea. So, yes, sir. And to the warmer, actually we have over in our area there, we have a couple that grows lettuce year round in one of these structures. They're hydroponic, they use your shade cloth. They did say in the hot part of the summer, it was a challenge. Uh, they had to use specific lettuce varieties that were more heat tolerant. And I don't know what varieties they, that were, but as Jeans Greens over in Coal Campus is, uh, we've got their name at home, Swaller I think is the last name. Uh, that does this so and if you want to talk to them just give the store a holler there at Morgan County Seeds we can get you their phone number and they have the plastic and shade cloth they just put the shade cloth over top of the plastic so that's the way most of them do it anyway so yes Okay. okay. Um, the automatic roll down, can you add that oh. once you've got a tunnel up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, any of these automatic controls can be added on later on. They're really not that hard to add on to it, so it's quite easy to add it to them. Uh, on the drop curtain, basically what it is, is that usually we go in the center of the tunnel, the end that the winches are on, and usually right above the door, so it's way above your head, about eight foot up eight to nine foot up. It just looks like a big winch on there that's electric. And then the cables from your sides come in either way. Uh, this particular machine has a uh, stops on it to work and only go so far one way and so far the other way. And then there is a controller that attaches to this machine that you can set at what various temperatures you want it to open and close and how long you want it to to run before it pauses and then how long it waits. The reason for that is, if you do that on auto controller is, say for instance the sun got out 
as cloudy and all of a sudden the sun broke through the clouds. Well, if you're in a tunnel, you know how quick that temperature can change in there. It can change very quickly. So with his auto controller, we usually like to set them up to where they only go down about six inches and then they pause. The reason for that is if you let that thing go all the way down, now the cloud comes in front of the sun again. You know how quick the temperature goes up. So this thing's got to crank it all the way up. Most likely by the time I got up in the top, the sun come back out again. So that thing's sitting there going up and down, up and down, up and down. As if you put a pause in there where it only runs so many seconds and then it's got to wait so many seconds. As a rule, you can get away from that. So it may open up and stay at that position for quite a while. And it might drop on down or, or it might close. It depends what the temperature does in there. So that's the reason you don't want the controllers to control the machine all the way open or all the way closed. You want it to pause in between there. The drawback to that is if you run in a situation where you've got a cold front coming in, your temperature's dropping very drastically in a quick time, it might not close it quick enough for you. So most of them have a manual override if you're there. You just a button you hit and you can override that all and close it up yourself. And the machine does the rolling. Yes? You said that it ran on electric. Is it something then you have to run? You're actually attaching to electric. It's not going to be a battery or a solar. You can run them off solar, but as a rule, they run them off 110. Uh, I know down in uh, Mountain Grove, theirs is actually run off of solar. So, yes, you can do solars. There's a gentleman here in Missouri, I think he's from Westphalia, Missouri, if I'm not mistaken by name, Henry Rents. He goes by Missouri Alternative Energy and has set up quite a few of these setups where they go in there and make a control. Now that controller they use there and the winch itself, I think it's a little different unit because it's designed for solar, but it works the same principle. Yes, if you go solar, you're looking, I'm not sure what the cost is, but it's considerable higher. But, you know, you don't have to run an electric line. Yes? Do you carry any of the, of the uh, wax control the end events? We personally do not control the wax controlled openers and closers. However, there are some there at our facilities. We're also the shipping department for Four Season Tools, and they have them in stock there. Eventually, that's supposed to be set up. It hasn't happened yet to where we'll have access to their small stuff to work and sell it to the customer. We can do that already right now. We just have to call into their office and get their pricing. We don't have the pricing there. So, yes, sir. On the Nolds brand, you're looking at a smaller one like the 850 that's strictly a pull type. There's some around... Uh, 18, 1900. If you go with the bigger one, now that one only has the ability to handle one wheel. The bigger ones, like the next size bigger up, they're 1500 or 150 series. The 150 is a three point, the 1500 is a pull type. I think those come in somewhere around 21, 2200. You look on the rain flow model, you get close to three, uh, close to uh, 25, 26 on them. So various companies have various prices. So and that price usually includes only one transplant wheel. So, and then you buy the other one extra, so. Super wheels run $140 for the wheels, and then your spikes run anywhere from, I think it's $5 to $7 a piece. So the super wheel comes with rubber blocks to fill each, plug each hole up, and then you just pull the block out and put your, put your spike in there, so. So. Yes, sir. Have you guys um, carried or experimented or seen anybody using any of the uh, like biodegradable paper mulches or, or anything like that? We carry the paper mulch there that's biodegradable. We also carry a plastic that's a biodegradable. Now, the plastic one is not certified organical. So if you're an organic grower, they most likely won't allow you to use it. The plastic has got the arm, I mean, not the plastic, the paper has the armory label on it. It's actually DeWitt's products is who we carry. The paper is a little more expensive. I got a feeling that price hopefully will come down in, the, in a few years to come by more people using it because more volumes out there, usually cheaper the product becomes in price. So, so would the water wheel transplanter work on that paper? Or would yes. It 
No, it'll go right through it. No problem. The only place it's going to make the hole is where your spike's at. Otherwise, that wheel there on the top is about six inches wide. And it's nice and smooth until the spike shows up. So, no, it won't go through your, plastic, your paper. Number one thing, your paper is considerably thicker than your plastic. Your plastic, you're looking at one mil to mil and a quarter, which is very thin. So, yes. Uh, on the paper that we carry, I'm not exactly sure what the length is. Uh, I imagine it would be gone before the end of the season is what I'm assuming. I really don't know. On the uh, plastic biodegradable, we have used that the last two years in our sweet potato patch. And usually by the time you come around to dig the sweet potatoes, the biggest part of it's gone already. And once not gone, you don't have to worry about it. Just go in with a disc and disc it up. It's this particular one here is a it's uh, we get it out an outfit out of Canada. Uh, the microbial life of the soil will break it down. The sunlight does. There's five different things that break this down, and uh, usually by the spring of year you can't find it anymore. It's all gone. The falling, no, there's not even pieces there. It's just amazing. So even if it's buried, it disappears. Or that's the experience we've had with it. Now I know years ago on some of the plastic mulches that were biodegradable. If the sunlight didn't get to it, it didn't disappear. So if you accidentally covered a piece with a disc or whatever it was, it stayed underneath there until you uncovered it and let the sunlight do its work. This particular one works five different ways can deteriorate that mulch. So, and I'd have to look what all five ways are. I know it's sunlight and, and uh, microbial life is two of them. So, but there's various manufacturers out there that build that, make that type of stuff also. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You were talking about, would it lay the paper as well? Yes. It'll lay paper. It will actually, we have folks that actually buy the black uh, ground cover. That's a woven material. We've had people buy that and lay it with it too. That's a more of a long-term situation. So, yes, sir. Drip tape. Yes. The lead brothers I was talking about earlier, when they go to lay plastic mulch, they bury their drip line approximately six inches down. That's awful deep. And they've been doing it for years already, and it works. Uh, now, the water pressure is at uh, 10 to 15 psi. And that's enough for pressure to open that line back up again. And when you really stop and think of it, that's not really that much pressure. But if you really want to find out how much 10 PSI is, turn your, water, turn, turn your drip line on and then go try to put a, a deal on the end. We usually, what we recommend that people do is fold it over itself three times and then cross fold it. Well, try to do that with your drip line turned on. I don't care who you are. There's nobody that's strong enough to hold that 10 pounds back and do that. I've had some very strong guys try it already. They can't do it. 10 pounds of pressure don't sound like much, but it's there's a lot more than you realize there. So. Just as a, of course, maybe not everybody would know this, but 10 to 15 pounds of pressure in a pressure canner is a lot of pressure. And it's kind of, you know. Yeah. It's still that steam pressure. 10 or 15 pounds of pressure in a and a pressure canner give you an idea, can blow that lid off the pressure canner off and right through the ceiling. So, you know, that don't seem like much, but there's a lot behind it. Yes, sir. Just like the drip tape you're using, is it like a six inch hole, eight inch hole, or eight inches? Drip tape is available in various sizes. I think you can get it as close as two inch spacing. The closest we carry is four, uh, is four inches. And you get it all the way up in the tape. I think the farthest you can get it apart that I've seen in the Jane Irrigation Catalog, I want to say 24 inches. And it's, the emitters put out various amounts of water. So you can basically order about whatever drip line you want, providing you're able to use the quantities that they require you in. Through Jane Irrigation, they recommend us to buy a pallet of shot, which is anywhere from 12 to 16 rows. So 
But uh, if you can find a supplier that stocks your particular size, you can get whatever you want in it. So as far as the hard stuff, the permanent stuff that you was talking about earlier, uh, we carry that in between 12, it's 12 inch, 18 inch, 24 and 36 inch. Well, we'd be carrying the 12 inch this coming year. That is permanent line like you use on your, like your grapes, your bambles, or even these people putting out the elderberries, that be, uh, we sold a lot of it for that. This particular tube is designed to be put in permanent to where it stays, and it'll last for years. Uh, one of the questions we have asked on both of them, do the mice bother? Yes, they do. They will chew on both of them. I don't know what for kick they get out of it. And it's not only mice. This summer, it's a lady that comes from us to our place from over Lawrence, Kansas area. She could not figure out what was eating her drip line. It was just making small holes in it. And she finally figured out what it was. And I never heard of them doing this before. The blister beetles were chewing her drip line up to get to that little water that was in that tape. So, and as, like I said, that's the first time I heard them doing that. So, we've had rabbits out in our place chewing a line and reading too, especially in our pumpkin and squash patches. They'll chew the line right plumbing too to get to the water. So, yes. In a blood meal solution, what I would do in that deal there, if the blood meal is not ground very fine, I would make a tea out of it first. Put it like in a nylon stocking or something like that and let it soak for a little while and get as much out of it as you can. The sprayers themselves have two sets of filters on it. There's a main suction filter and then there's a filter behind the nozzles that's usually somewhere around a 50, to 50 mesh, sometimes just a 20 mesh. And whatever that mesh is is what will go through your tip there. Under them tremendous amount of pressure, like your blood meal, I would guess it would blow it through there anyway because at that point it's going to be soft. So now I have never tried it through there, but I think it would work. Well, yes, ma'am. Um, we put in strawberry plugs. Yes. And we kind of held it up. Um, and then we bought our drip line. Okay. So it's laying like, I don't know, an inch or two away from the strawberries on top of the row. Okay. Um, next to it, but it's inside our tunnel. Do you okay. have any kind of recommendations? Is that, should we have buried it? Is it okay this way for this winter? You don't have plastic mulch or anything, do you? We, we no, but we have um, got the black mesh. Okay. Just a woven mesh. Mm -hmm. So in other words, your liquid will go through that. In that particular case, you can get by with a drip line on top of the top of the other. It'll work fine for you. Drip line does not have to be buried to work. Uh, drip line can also be used in, like I was talking earlier about growing all the green beans we grew. We would plant them green beans with our planter earthquake garden cedar, and then we would pull a drip line right over top of it. And every so often, we just take a handful of dirt and put it on top of the drip line to keep the wind from blowing it around. And that drip line stayed on top of the ground. Now, over the season, tilling it there, the tiller covered a little bit. But it will work perfect fine laying right on top of the soil, or in your case, on top of the woven mesh. Well, and the mesh isn't actually over the row because what, we didn't have it when we planted the strawberries. Uh -huh. So it's actually up to it. So in that case, is it okay that the drip line, would it be better to be under the mesh or to should it be on top of it? It really isn't going to make any difference. In your case there, let's, let's face it, I'll admit it, I'm a little on the lazy side. I'll just lay it out and let it lay right there. Now, you might have to get yourself like a, a sod staple or bend you a piece of wire that's in a U-shape every so often to hold it there. So that's, you know. That's a good question, and I really don't know how to answer that. If it's like most crops, you want to keep the soil moist. Uh, Patrick Byers is here today. He might be able to answer that question a little better than I do. Uh, I work a lot with vegetables. I know with vegetables, we try to keep the moisture at a constant level to where it doesn't fluctuate much. That depends on the usage of your... There's a lot of variables come in there. What's the size of your plants? What's your temperature? 
and all that type of stuff and the condition of your soil when you plant it. Yes, there will be days that you most likely will water every day, and there'll be times you might water once a week. It has a lot to do with the size of the crop and the use that the crop's using at time. So you just got to keep an eye on it. Okay. That's that'd be fine. Yeah, that's what I would do. I know I tell the folks, and especially in tomato production, you know, you got the plastic mulch over, the ground is not exposed. How do you tell whether that thing needs moisture or not? I always tell them they can either reach around the plant in there, or what we used to do is just take our knuckles and roll on top of the plastic, just like this here. If it feels like bread dough under there, still on the soft side, you're all right. If it feels like this tabletop hard, then you know you've got a problem. You need more moisture there. Uh, and it shouldn't be at any time when you're kneeling, and you're taking your knuckles there. You never should have it go well, then you got way too much water. So, but you want to keep it in an even moisture. Rice crops will perform better in an even moisture than a fluctuating. Uh, taking tomatoes, for instance, you can actually cause your tomatoes by cracking but drastically changing your moisture level. Now there's other things that go in effect there also, but moisture is one of them that will do it. Heat will also do it. But uh, that's one thing, you know, if you plant a tomato plant that's producing tomatoes and it gets in the dry side, and all of a sudden there's a slug of water. Tomato's the hog of the vegetable world. That plant's gonna suck up all the moisture it can and it's gonna stuff it in them fruits. Well, since them skins on that fruit were were formed over the time as a little dry period they don't have quite the elasticity that they should have so when that plant stuffs all that water in that fruit you're going to end up with a crack almost guaranteed now that crack can also be caused by uh, getting in a nice hot day and the thunderstorm comes through and it cools it off real quick that will crack them too so there's various different things some varieties are more prone to cracking than others and uh, I know their strawberries will end up with holla hard. I know they have that. I don't know stro. I don't think strawberries crack like that. Not that it makes me any difference. They're good anyway. So, <laughs> so. I'll yes. Uh-huh. One of the tricks that we have learned there, he was wanting to know what you do after you got your plastic mulch down your drip line underneath and you come back to transplant it. Now, you take it, you're going to be transplanting by hand. Okay. One thing you do there, turn your drip line on. Turn the water on. It's a little harder to poke a hole in something round than when it's flat. And that's the trick we use when we grow sweet, when we punch the holes for sweet potatoes. We actually have a uh, sharpened shovel handle is what we use, an old D handle, and it's pretty sharp. Turn the drip line on. When you get to the drip line, it just pushes it off the side and it goes right in through there. So that's one thing you use. Water wheel transplanter, then spikes on there is not that sharp. The only time you're going to end up with a hole with a water wheel transplanter is if you have a rock right directly in between the planter deal and the drip line. The drip line's in between the two. Then you wind up with a hole. Going back to that 5,000 cantaloupe plants we planted. Now we've got some what we call gravelly soil there. And we had a few holes that we had a patch there, which is quite easy to do with drip line. But we noticed each time where there was a hole like that, where the spike made that hole, there's always a, a little rock underneath there and the two come together, well, naturally, it's going to give a hole because the weight of the wheel and everything else, that just punches a hole. So, but we had very few holes that we had to patch. And patch and drip line is quite simple. In that case there, you just cut the bad part out and put a coupler in there. Quite simple. So, I'll be back at my booth. If it, just feel free to come by and ask questions. Like I said, if you want to look at these photos, I'll have them there for you. So.